All right, everybody, welcome to the April New York Enterprise Tech Meetup. We are so thrilled to see everyone tonight, especially given it's a nice night out. But really, we know the draw tonight is our amazing fireside chat we're going to have with Kevin Wang, who is CPO and initially was employee number five at Braze. So there's going to be a lot of knowledge bombs shared. So feel free to tweet away and tweet often. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Danny. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming out tonight, um, especially when it's all so beautiful outside. Early spring is hard to get yourself indoors for enterprise software, but we're very thankful that you're here with us. Um, as John said, I'm Danny Chesley. I'm a principal here at Workbench. We're a $125 million seed stage fund. Um, and before joining Workbench, I was a product manager at Hyperscience, a later stage data company here in New York City. So I'm super excited to talk to Kevin. Uh, before we dive into the nitty gritty though, uh, one icebreaker just to get things going. Um, Bonus points if no one's ever heard of it, but do you have one favorite go-to restaurant under the radar? Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is under the radar, but actually my favorite restaurant in, in Manhattan is right next to this venue. It's Utoya. Uh, actually, Kelly, I, I've been there uh, with Kelly before, and it's my, I knew it was my favorite because Utoya has like the, the hallmark sign of a place with really good food, which is that it has older people who are eating alone because uh, a lot of people who are you know, older, it's like they're not looking for novelty. They're not looking for new experiences. They're looking for good experiences. If you're eating alone, then you really mean it. And so, yeah, I like Utoya a lot. That's so funny because I actually went there today and I've never been there before, but totally to your point, people are eating alone. I was actually eating alone before my person came. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to tell my team that. <laughs> yeah. um, awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming. Would love to have just like the quick one minute background of who you are, why you're here and everything you've uh, seen in between. Yeah, so uh, my name's Kevin. I run product and the chief product officer at Braves. So we're an enterprise SaaS customer engagement platform uh, headquartered here in New York. And so I actually used to be a consultant. Um, so I'm sort of still recovering from that even many, many years later. Uh, I joined Braves in uh, 2012 when it was a very, very small startup. Uh, I was an engineer at the time. And then as we scaled up, I was an engineer, ran tech recruiting for a while, was an engineering manager. And then uh, when we were around about $5 million of ARR, just to sort of set context, hopped over to uh, the product side and then built out our product team from then until now. Awesome. What was the New York City tech ecosystem like in 2012? What were people building, thinking about? Oh, yeah. It was desolate. <laughs> and it, it, was, um, it was very, very, very focused on um, sort of that. If people have seen Silicon Valley season one, there's that solo mo moment where they go on TechCrunch and they talk about how we're going to be social, local, and mobile. And that was like definitely the thing. Foursquare was the, the coolest product um, on the block. And I think that one of the dimensions of it that was very different from right now is that the, the sorts of people who are in tech were much, much less technical than today. I mean, obviously, with AI and the rise of AI and um, so much tech going on, it, it's kind of cool to code again. But at the time, you know, if you said you were an engineer, people were like, oh, Oh, I, I see. And uh, so th that was a very, very large uh, difference, I think, from, from then to now. Yeah, that makes total sense. How did the, I guess, external ecosystem and what people were building help influence what you guys were even thinking about at Breeze? Yeah, so the... The external ecosystem, I think that the dimension of it that we sort of were drawing the most inspiration from or that we were thinking about the most was, uh, was certainly mobile. And in particular was this idea that mobile was ultimately going to change a lot of different dimensions of technology, but also as sort of a second order effect, a lot of different dimensions of society, right? Like if you look at a random example, Uber, which was tiny at that time, Uber is a company that exists because of mobile, but it's not like a mobile company, I guess, if you think about it. And so we we were really interested in some of the second order effects that were going to happen from mobile, like your identity is your device, you have many devices, everything happens in real time because it has to be super personal um, once this device is in your pocket and it's always connected. And so those were some of the broader trends that we were, uh, that we were really keying in on. Yeah, that makes total sense. And given that you're, un you're going under a paradigm shift to mobile at that time and everyone's thinking about social, local, mobile, um, how do you even think about like the actual customer pain points that you wanted to target given you were employee five and they're so early? Yeah, so I think that the 
the way that we were generally thinking about it was that there had obviously been, uh, you know, if you kind of roll back the clock, 20, 2011, 2012, there had clearly been a very large platform shift with the web in the early 2000s. And people, people still, like, remembered. I mean, I think now there's probably a lot of people out there in tech, they don't remember .com, but at the time... Web 1.0 was a very salient memory. And what people really remembered from Web 1.0, especially within you know, the marketing field and the marketing digital buyers that we had, was that it had been very scary and a lot of people had lost their jobs and you know, marketing was completely overturned by that shift. And so as a result, sort of the second time around, everyone was very paranoid. Like, what's this mobile thing? What's going on? How is this going to, to change and impact um, the overall ecosystem um, that's going on? And so we were able to, when you're having conversations, Conversations start to figure out what are their incentives going to be, and the incentives were very clear, which is which were essentially we know things are going to change. Help us not miss whatever comes next, because we don't want to end up like we did 12 years ago. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thinking about the just changing landscape at that point, then, and you know, they always say that you want to be so close to your customers and your users. How did you go about finding these users in the early days when mobile is still a burgeoning ecosystem and everyone has their own problems? Yeah, so uh, it was hard, and actually, uh, Braze's uh, founding CEO just walked in and was was actually the the number one. Uh, Mark was probably the number one reason that we were able to have tons and tons of conversations early on, establishing product market fit. And I, I think that the main the main thing that I took away from that was that when you're trying to get product market fit, it's important to to not be really precious about the process. Like you just need to get in front of many, many different people. Like be kind of shameless asking what they're trying to do. Be kind of shameless, you know, saying what you think that you're able to offer. And you you have to sort of force product market fit to happen. I think that out in the tech media, the the sort of breathless tech crunch take out there is that product market fit is sort of this magical thing that is bestowed upon you, in some cases bestowed upon you by a very fancy venture capital firm, and that that's how sort of like products get born. In reality, it's like completely the opposite. It's like mainly begging and borrowing people and bothering people and then forcing things to happen. Yeah. How do you know that you have product market fit then? Just jumping around here. Yeah, I, I mean, it's ex so I think the interesting thing with product market fit is that it's extremely unambiguous when you have it. And so people who are sort of wondering like, oh, like, do I have product market fit? Do I not have product market fit? If you're asking that question, you, I'm very sorry, you do not have product market fit. And if you are like really asking that question and you find yourself almost arguing with yourself, then you're probably actually not even close. Um, the, the thing that I found really interesting about product market fit that I didn't expect was that it doesn't manifest as people being like, oh, wow, what a great product. Like, we're so happy that you're here. Take our money. It actually looks like people who are like sort of busy and annoyed with you because you have built an MVP and it's like, you know, the, the M is capitalized, not the V and not the P. And so it's a very minimal, very minimal product. But people actually are relying on it. And usually at that point, your product like really sucks. Like it's terrible. And so people rely on your terrible product and they get very, very upset. And so we actually started to see it in a lot of cases in the form of um, increasingly like detailed support tickets with uh, kind of an exasperated tone. <laughs> I think that that was a, a very strong sign of product market fit. And then the other one that I would, uh, would say was that, um, at least in our case, we were fortunate that we closed a number of uh, sort of like true enterprise logos in the early days. And when enough of them line up and they're not just using your product, but they're using your product the way that you had intended the product to be used, th that's the key sign. Because the, other, the terrible head fake, I think, for product market fit that people find is when they, they go a little overboard in terms of trying to meet their customers exactly what the customer's needs are. And they just build a Frankenstein of a product. It does 10 things because they have 10 people paying them, but none of them are actually using the product for what actually matters. I think that's, that's a, a major risk to try to avoid. That's so helpful. And, you know, going totally off topic, um, you know, oftentimes you hear about people saying, you know, you have to listen to your customers and help them help build the product that they need, but you also have to have your, your own vision. Do you have any thoughts there on how, you know, the early stage founders in the room might be able to better navigate that? Yeah, I think that, th I, I think that it's, this is sort of the fundamental balance of product market fit is that you, 
you need to have a real perspective on what to build because otherwise you're like a dev agency. And it's like, it's fine to be a dev agency, but de- dev agencies don't compound value the way that an actual startup does. You compound value in line with a vision. But I think you need to be very flexible about the vision that you're actually, uh, that you're actually going after because pretty much all startups obviously pivot at least somewhat. You know, they pivot at least 30, 45 degrees along the journey. And I, I think that what... I would try to focus on is very big picture, like what are the facts about three to five years from now? And by the way, like not 12 months from now and not 10 years from now, it's got to be kind of three to five years so that you're going to have something commercializable. What are the facts about that world three to five years from now that you are very, very confident in? And I think it's actually also another overplayed trope to say that you need to be like really, really contrarian. Like if you go out of your way to be contrarian, that's like don't, don't waste the calories trying to be contrarian. Just like, wh- what do you think the world's going to look like? And then how can you build towards that? And that's the vision. The vision isn't like, I have the right Figma drawing of what people are going to need because you can't have that gr- level of granularity. Yeah. No, I love that. And like I said earlier, I already deviated from the, the sheet that I have in my hand. But going... Okay, well, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it live. Yeah. yeah, let's do it live. Uh, going backwards in time to what I wanted to ask initially... Um, you know, you talked about landing an enterprise design partner really early. Do you have any tips for the early stage builders out there about how to go about that process, especially when they're, you know, maybe pre-product market fit? Yeah, so I, I do think, it, you know, if you're building in the enterprise, like, that is the way to do it. As much as there's a playbook, it is, like, you find a bunch of enterprise buyers. Ideally, don't just find one, like, find... A, a bunch because a bunch are not going to work out. A bunch are going to be, a bunch are going to get distracted. Uh, probably a small minority are just going to end up being like kind of dumb and their feedback like doesn't matter. And you, you want to get rid of all of those and then still have some left over. And, and then the way I think about it is you, you want to be like the, a little bit like the desperate clingy boyfriend in a romantic comedy where you're like kind of like doing everything like a little bit extra for them. Like you're just making it really, really clear that you're a little desperate and that you will go the extra mile because you're a little desperate, but you know, not, not too desperate. Like don't, don't like freak anybody out. And I think that that's roughly the mode to be in to try to make it, make things work until you have traction. And then the, the irony is that once you have traction, this becomes one of those, and, and you know, you've got 20 paying customers and you really have strong product market fit. This is one of those areas where I think people struggle because you have to actually immediately flip your posture and only start to build things that everyone in your customer base is going to need and build straight for your vision. And I think that transition is something that I do see some, some folks struggle with. When you think back to the Breeze journey then, did you guys start really horizontal and wide and then over time isolate more towards your eventual ICP or did you guys have a lot of pivots along the way or anything like that? Uh, well, there was, there was one very large pivot away from essentially a social network for apps, which we weren't able to get traction for in the very earliest days. But then we stayed pretty true to that overall vision of um, customer engagement, marketing automation, um, CRM for a long duration of time, including actually a long duration of sort of being out in the wilderness and not having those customers and you know, essentially waiting for the market to turn towards us. But in terms of how horizontal, I would say we were fairly narrowed in on that ICP from, from the early stages. The, the big transition was that the customer profile we were selling to, that customer profile was actually in transition. So in a way, we kind of built for what they became and waited for them, as opposed to you know, tracking their every move in the way that, I, for example, I think a lot of AI companies are trying to do that right now, where you're trying to figure out like what is everybody going to want, but the landscape as it changes very quickly, it can be hard to track and some will get it right, some will get it wrong. Yeah, and that totally goes back to your initial point about how do you find product market fit? You have to have your own vision, continue to track with customers, but over time it narrows down. Um, speaking back to that, I know that you know you just mentioned Mark joined, uh, came in the room, but you know you, I know from listening to a few podcasts with you that there were a few inflection points at Braze, in Braze's journey where it felt like you guys were going to run out of money. Um, those felt like really, really big pivotal moments. Is there anything you could share there? Because every early stage startup has uh, has burn problems at some point. Yeah. So I I think the the biggest the biggest takeaway that I had I guess from that whole experience is that like 
bad things happen to good people. And um, startups are, I don't know, if you've seen those nature documentaries, have you ever seen those nature documentaries where you've got a bunch of turtles that get born on the beach and they've got to like, make it to the ocean? I see a few people recognize it. That's kind of like the startup journey a little bit. And you know, sometimes you're like a really fast turtle and the seagull picks you and eats you. And so I, I think that it's like, <laughs> the main thing is like, don't get discouraged, I think, if you are getting close to running out of money. I mean. Obviously, like, get discouraged enough to do something about it, but I, I do think that it is normal for a lot of things to, to not cut your way and to, to get very close to, to running out of money. Um, we, we were certainly you know, just as guilty of that as anyone else. And so, some of the particular challenges I think that we had were mainly oriented around that, the fact that we had essentially built for where we thought the world was going to go. And then we were fortunate enough that the world did turn that way. But had it come too late, that would have been really bad. Um, had we gotten that wrong, that also would have been really bad. And um, a lot of the sort of running very, very low on cash was due to being almost too late. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Uh Sorry, I thought I saw a hand in the back. Um, no, super interesting. And, you know, having dealt with so many early stage companies ourselves, we hear such similar things from those that have scaled out of that really early stage journey. I guess as you reflect back on that pre-product market fit stage, is there any number one learning that you had that really defined your time back from, you know, maybe zero to 500K in revenue? Yeah, I think, let's see. I think that one one major learning is that it's just very hard to define product market fit. Like you, you'll know it when you have it, but there isn't a firm playbook. And it's a little bit like it's a little bit kind of like finding a spouse or like falling in love, where it's like you can, there isn't like a playbook for it. But there are things that you can do to increase the chances. Like you can go on a lot of dates. You can be open minded. You can <laughs> you know work really hard at it. Uh, th these things help a lot. I think one of the major things that I see being very instrumental to product market fit, um, though other than sort of mindset strategic things, is to have um, a very, very strong team of builders. Uh, that, that is really, really key because it just gives you so many more cycles, so many more iterations to try to hit product market fit. Uh, this is something where you want to be able to take 100 shots on goal. You don't want to have to take three shots on goal because that's all you're able to do with, uh, with the velocity that you have. And then the other thing is that one of the keys for the velocity is to not like play startup dress up or try to be a bigger company than you actually are pre-product market fit. Like random example from us, um, I know that I wrote a lot of tests, like code integration tests in the early days before we had product market fit. And that was all wasted and we deleted all of it and it was useless. And I wish that I hadn't done it because, but we were doing it because we were thinking like, oh, well, it's code, you got to test your code. None of that sort of thing really matters. And so what I think is really important is just eye on the prize. You're trying to get to like 10 paying customers who are not related to you or your best friends. And if you can get to that point, that, that's the point where you can start to write your tests. Yeah. Once you get to that point, how do you think about scaling up from there? You, you think you have hints of product market fit. Is it time to hire an AE and start hitting every, up every enterprise customer? Or how do you see that world? Yeah, so uh, I think for one thing, that's like the most exciting point in a lot of ways on the journey. Um, generally, the way that I think about that is that once you have the kernel of product market fit, there are sort of two things that you should be doing, at least on the, the building side. Then I'll speak to the go-to-market a bit. But the two things that you should be doing are just building every single feature that is going to help you develop a moat. Um, against your competitors because your product is probably, if you have product market fit, your product is probably much better along a few dimensions than all the incumbents. That's why you have product market fit. And it's probably much worse on all the other dimensions. So for you to continue to close business away from those ultra early adopters, you need to make sure that in whatever way you're special, you get special, more special. You, know, you become spikier. And then I think it's actually also important to dedicate a lot of the roadmap to just building the things that you know that you will one day need or that your customers will need. So in the very early days um, at Braze, one of the ways that I would speak about this with our product team is I would say, like, for any, like, we have to ask three questions for any product decision. Like, is somebody going to churn because we don't have this? Great. Build it. Is somebody, are we going to close new business reliably if we have this product? Great. Build it. And if we picture ourselves at the point of going public, is this a feature that makes sense in our product or not? If it is, great, build it. And anything else, you just skip everything and then focus almost entirely on velocity. Yeah, I was going to ask how you think about architecting a product as you scale from SMB to 
enterprise, but it sounds like you guys are thinking enterprise day one. We don't want to disqualify any any leads. Yeah, so we were actually not. And so at one point, we had both a free trial sign up, fr- not not even just free trial, freemium. So you know, even more committed to, to the free tier, as well as trying to close um, enterprise deals. And I like, really do not recommend this. It was very, very confusing. So uh, I was actually fortunate enough to work on building out the, the free trial product. And because, I don't know, maybe this is sort of like, you know, s- sick sadism or whatever, but because I had built it as my baby, they made me go and delete the code um, <laughs> when we got rid of it. And we just, it was a firm strategic decision of this is too distracting. It's, you know, people are signing up and paying us $10 a month and we could have been, they should have been paying us six figures and uh, it's like freaking people out and so just get rid of it. And so we, we did ultimately commit very, very hard to the enterprise and I think the, the key thing is that you've got to commit. Mm-hmm. So no matter what, you have to choose one way or the other which way you're going to go? I think you have to choose in the early stages, uh, personal, personally. I, I guess maybe if you have the equivalent of Slack and a really large customer shows up, like don't, don't like refuse their money, I guess. But I would still focus on that sector until one is at at least probably five, $10 million of ARR because I think that it, it really is too distracting when you have this huge backlog of things that all of your customers are going to need because the go to, in a SaaS company, like the go-to-market motion in many ways steers the strategic direction of the company or steers aspects of it. And, and you, can't, you can't let the tail wag the dog. Like you need to make sure until you're at scale at least, if not beyond, that product, the product and the product vision that you're building towards are still in charge. Yeah, that makes total sense. As you think about you know building a product and sales motion linearly, how do those two things scale? Is it let's first deploy resources to R and D and you know really invest there, or do you start building out that sales team? And I realize that you know maybe sales go to market isn't the bread and butter, but just yeah, I mean I'm, I'm happy. Is. It's been a while, so I'm happy to speak to it. Um, I, I think it depends a lot on the stage. Uh, you know, once you're at growth, I don't know how many folks here are at, you know Series C or beyond. Maybe show of hands. Okay, a, a few folks. Like, it, as you know, it, it becomes sort of math once you're at the growth stages. Like, it's you need a certain sales efficiency, and you're talking about like ramping your AEs, and what's your support model, and you know what's your pipeline ratio. Like, it, it all of it kind of converges to be math at the growth stages. But at the early stages, the way that I, I think about it is that I think it's much more bespoke to the particular product that you have. I mean, there are products very, very enterprisey where you're just founder-led sales almost. You know the whole way through. There are companies, if you're talking about sort of PLG SaaS, where it starts to become much more formulaic, and it's all math on the customer acquisition side, on the adoption and um, and um, activation side in the early stages. So I, I don't think that it's one size fits all. What I the main takeaway that I would have is that. I think you can just kind of do whatever makes sense till about five or ten million ARR. But once you are past that, I think it's really important that you lock in your go-to-market and your product strategy. So whatever you're building, you know that your go-to-market motion will be able to sell it, and whatever you're selling, you know that your product will be able to support the use cases. That that's where things can get out of sync. Yeah. What was your product, or sorry, what was your go-to-market motion like in those early days? Uh, it was a lot of founder-led sales, and then um, increasingly just a lot of pr- pretty standard enterprise sales. And, and that's why we got rid of all these free trials, because you have this sort of you know, dangling appendage of free trial go-to-market motion attached to a very normal, go-to- normal enterprise SaaS go-to-market motion, and that caused the distraction. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's pretty important to not try to like reinvent the wheel on a lot of go to market best practices like maybe you think that you have like a way better way to run a sales team but like you probably don't and i, I wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't like you know bet your company on it yeah no, that makes total sense and it's so interesting cuz at least for us you know we spend so much time on the enterprise side we're seeing a you know recursion back to top down enterprise sales be curious if you have any take, takes on plg i know you had a freemium trial for a period of time yeah, and, and actually, uh, I'll, I'll give a pitch to you guys too, which is that because I think that go to market, there are playbooks and there are best practices. It's like you know, take Workbench's advice. If they tell you this is what works, it probably works. And so I, I, I think that's important to listen to. Um, man, in terms of PLG, so so here's the thing. I think that post COVID, you know, after everyone spent all this time sitting around in flip flops um, and sweatpants. Like getting 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 SaaS demos, people I think are just a little bit less interested in getting taken to a steak dinner 
to buy software. But on the other side, if you're going to spend a million dollars as a SaaS buyer, like that is that is an emotional journey for you because if you really really screw that up, that's kind of like it's it's your butt on the line. And so as a result, I think that there is room for. Um, enterprise sales. I think that there will always be room for enterprise sales because there's no way to get rid of that um, that sort of emotional element behind the purchase. With that said, I think that the world is generally going to a world where people want to kick the tires on products more than um, more than they did before, and I, I view that as kind of like a ratchet. Like that's not going to go. That's not going to go back the other way. People aren't going to suddenly be like, oh, you know what? Like I, I actually don't want to kick the tires anymore. I'd rather you just you know demoed it off of PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, thinking about the world today where there's like there's SaaS for everything, right? SaaS for marketing, SaaS for mobile marketing, SaaS for everything. How do you even think about the white spaces today? Because I do know you you angel invest a little bit. So how do you think about the spaces that you know people should be playing in, or how do you validate that those spaces are even real? Oh uh, yeah, you mean you don't just like say AI three times and spin in a circle and then like you know venture dollars, right? Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think I mean I can tell you some of the spaces that I that I'm excited about, which is I I like spaces where there's a strong enterprise need, and for some reason tech is just making it easier to solve the problem better, or otherwise just like throwing that industry into chaos. I think that that's where all the opportunities end up uh, l- largely end up getting getting built out. I, I also think that in terms of white space, one area that is somewhat underrated is that. A lot of industries basically just sort of turn over on like a six to fifteen year time cycle, and I think that that often gets missed because these industry the, those cycles are shorter in some industry verticals and they're longer in others. Like in supply chain or finance, they have very long cycles. You know, they're all still running on like very old technology because they're probably running off of. In, I mean, I know they are running off of many of the cycles from like the computing age. Like you know, forget the internet. Like pre-internet, they're still on that cycle. Whereas for for marketing, for example, where Braze operates, it's, it's a much faster cycle. And so we have to stay much more on top of these technology cycles because it turns over quicker. But I think that that's where a lot of the, where the white space is, is just try to figure out what is that next industry that's going to, to turn over. Um, I realize this isn't like some, you know, yeah. magical I, I insight curious, though. Like, you know, for you, you've been from, you know, pre-product market fit all the way through a hyper growth company that's IPO'd. So for you now, as you look back, how do you help early stage founders or, you know, even people building out new products at Braze validate that the customer pain point that they have is a real problem to go out there and solve? Yeah, so I think one of the, I mean, at, at Braze, we have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different techniques here. So one of the ones that we'll do is that we just like, we start asking people if they're going to pay for stuff like really early and we're like super shameless about it. We're just like, okay, like, will you pay us? Like you just saw the demo, like you clicked on it three times, like where, where are you going to pay? And you know, some of them are like, oh, I don't know, but they're usually pretty honest. I mean, SaaS buyers are very, very rational. I think that because the word sales gets attached to the SaaS purchasing process, everyone sort of associates it with the sales that they're used to, which is basically like used car salesman or like, you know, you're, you're at a market and someone's trying to like sell you, a, sell you a rug or like sell you apples at a farmer's market. And it, it's very different. You know, these, these buyers are very highly incentivized to, uh, to pick strong vendors for, for a very long period of time. I think we can actually in some ways thank um, corporate security and legal teams for this, where the more of a pain in the ass it is to buy a product, the less people want to turn it over and the more they actually care about the product being a good long-term partner for them. And so uh, the way that we'll do a lot of the validation is that we are just very, very direct about asking what people are going to pay for and then also asking questions that really demonstrate intent. So we'll say things like, all right, um, if you were to use, if you're going to use this product, like you said that you were interested, can you name like three things that you're going to do with it? Like the first week, what are you going to do? And all the tourists at that point are just sort of stuttering, like, oh, well, I don't know. Like, I thought it was cool when you demoed it, but I'd have to think about I got to talk to my team. Right. Yeah. Like, sure, buddy. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> we just try to be very, very specific and try to get dollar amounts on these things. And, and we find that our Buyers act very, and our customers act very much like partners on that front. 
Yeah, that's great advice. There's a, a great book that I know the Workbench team has all read called The Mom Test that talks all about that. And the moment that you start asking people to pay real money for the thing that you are pitching them is when you'll get the real feedback of how they feel. Yeah, and, and often if you're building the right thing, um, it, I mean, it's it's so stereotypical, but you will see the stereotypical stuff where people are like canceling. They're saying like, look, I don't, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Just what is it? what's it going to cost? Like, if this is going to be too expensive, then we don't need to keep talking. And of course, in your head, you're like, oh, well, I was going to give it to you for free, is there but one sign? <laughs> in that case. Is there one sign that this buyer or this end user loves your product and, and they are ready to use it right now? Um, in So I would say for, for getting initial product market fit for folks, it, it would definitely be the asking for pricing. And the way that they will ask is also kind of predictable, which is that they will ask sort of nervously because they'll be like, look, I really like this, but if you're about to charge me X, then I can't get that through. And so like, don't waste my time. And because at that point, that really confirms that this is a real problem. They, they have budget for it or they're confident they can get budget for it because the, bu the budget is concrete enough that they know if you're over budget. And so that, that is a very, very um, concrete test, I would say. Yeah, that makes total sense. I realized that there was an entire section of all these questions that I totally skipped over. Um, one of them being, you know, how do you even think about teams? Like, right, you were yeah. originally a software engineer, transitioned to product manager, and then over time owned more and more of the product org. How do you think about building out teams in the early, early stages? So let's see. I, it it depends a lot. So you said the early, early stages. So I'll answer that. So. Um, in the very early stages of Braze, I was an engineer and an engineering manager. And so my answer is somewhat different from if you're thinking about building a product team. But happily, my advice in the very early stages would be don't hire PMs. And so because of that, we don't need to talk about the PM side. Uh, I, I think that teams underrate how important it will be that they have very high output business savvy engineers. I think that those engineers are the probably the single biggest driver and the single factor that you can get onto your team that most indicates success at sort of the the middle stages and growth stages of a company because of how much the technical decisions that they make in the very earliest stages before you even have a business are going to impact the the degree the depth and the width of the moat that you will have at the growth stages. So th that is the single, the single strongest one. The other is that I think teams hire designers. So, some teams hire designers too late. Um, th that's uh, a slightly different one, but I think it's really, really important to have at least one designer um, early. In fact, not just at least one designer. I think it's really important to have exactly one designer because you also don't want two designers fighting. Designers like to disagree about the vision when there's a green uh, when there's green field in front of them. You don't want them disagreeing, and so that that's the the main way that um, that I would think about this. Yeah, and then I guess what would be the time to hire PMs? Yeah, the the time to hire a PM is kind of when you have a discrete business problem and d business area of business ownership that you're able to slice off and give to them when essentially the product focused founders uh, like working memory can no longer or maybe short term memory whatever it is cannot hold the entire set of decisions on the product in your head and i think first off it's actually worth holding as much of it in your as much of it in your head as you can as long and as late as possible because again with the compounding you're just compounding good decisions that you'll be able to reap the rewards of later but then when it's too large then you have to start to split stuff off but the, the main thing is don't hire a p a first pm who's just going to be like your intern Right, where you're just like, hey, you know, like writing Jira tickets really sucks. So it'd be great if you could like write all my Jira tickets. That's that's not good because you're first off they'll they'll get it wrong because you've you've kind of improperly cut off the part of your job that can't be done independently. But also, what kind of person is going to go to like you know your seed stage startup and write Jira tickets? Like this person's probably not like a real killer. Totally. And you also don't, like if I was going to go and get an, another job at a startup company, I wouldn't want to be just, you know, executing exactly what the CEO's vision is. So I guess at what point or like rather what stage of PM do you even hire for that kind of job? If it's really early, head of product? Really early? Um, I think 
it, I mean, it's it's all going to be situationally dependent, and it depends who okay. who you're able to hire and the state of your business and their fit for it. I I mean, this is more of just a general hiring philosophy, but I think it's probably better if you can find someone to just be like you know first lead PM or whatever. But try to hire someone who has the potential to step into the head of product role because I do think that there is an element in early stage early stage hiring where you are trying to hire people who you think have very high potential aptitude, and they're I mean. I guess this is sort of an offensive way to describe, it, but they're kind of like you're, you're kind of hiring like call options on leaders later on, and because not everyone's going to be able to scale to that, but some are, and you'll want them with high context already in your organization at that point. Yeah, that makes total sense. So I know that we're coming up on time here. I have two last questions before maybe we do a quick just like one Q and A. Um, is there any piece of online media about PMs? There's so much, you know. Substacks podcasts out there that talk about product management in general. Um, is there anything that you disagree with heavily? Uh, there's a lot. Um, let's see. I think so. I think w- I'll just mention one, which is that I, I, I do think that people uh, a lot of um, so, uh, there's this there's this really common phrase out there of like if what from Henry Ford that quote like if I'd asked customers what they wanted they would have told me that they wanted faster horses I think that is so patronizing and offensive like if you go and you like you're gonna go and at, like you're making some SaaS product for you know procurement or supply chain you're gonna go to Apple and then you're gonna ask them and you're gonna like ignore what they tell you because you think that they're gonna ask you for faster horses like they're way better at supply chain than you are they're Apple like th- these are world experts that you're talking to uh, I th- I have been very pleasantly surprised by the the degree to which a lot of customers, you know, you you have to filter it a bit by the degree to which many of the smartest customers can literally call the right roadmap for you because they've tried every product, they've tried every tool, they know all of their goals, they know all of their problems, they know next year's goals. I mean, you know, they're they're thinking ahead as well, just like you are uh, as somebody operating a startup. And I think that you can learn a huge, huge amount from your sharpest customers. That's an area where we've invested in very heavily is trying to learn those lessons. Awesome. And then what's one or two pieces of advice you wish you gave yourself back when you first joined Breeze? Yeah, I think, let's see, I think that the one of the biggest pieces of advice that I wish I had was to, to not like overthink things. I mean, I definitely had had slash have um, still um, all sorts of moments of imposter syndrome when you're like, oh, like I haven't seen this challenge before. I haven't seen this situation before. This makes me very nervous. I'm going to go, you know, do the normal things that one does when you feel anxious about a decision. Like, I'm going to go get a bunch more data. I'm going to go talk to a bunch of people. I'm going to do whatever it is that's going to make you more comfortable with the unknown. And I wish that I had sort of turned the dial somewhat and just kind of taken a risk and gone for it a little bit faster, even if you were going to make a mistake. Because I think that the value of speed compounds so much and the value of having a culture of like deep urgency compounds so much that it's it's just almost always worth doing that. And if you make a wrong decision, most things are reversible. I mean, it's software, right? You can you can change the code. It's not a big deal. Yeah. No, love that. Yeah. Except uh, your pricing model. Yeah. Just that, be that careful was, with your that pricing was definitely model. Tougher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome learnings. Anyone in the crowd have any questions? <clears throat> so you talked about the separation of you know, when you, when you try to reduce your choices and go from enterprise and free and reduce it. Uh, but the other side of that, in my mind, is tech debt questions, where you make choices because you're focused on S&D, and then you try solving enterprise problems and your model doesn't work, and you have to re-engineer your whole product, the, under, the underpinnings. Is that, can you talk a little bit about how you to avoid that? Yeah, so I, I do think... Uh, if I'm answering this question correctly, um, I will say that I think in a lot of ways it's easier to go from something more SMB focused to something more enterprise focused than the other way around because enterprise products tend to explode out in terms of complexity so much that you, you can never put that genie back in the bottle or it's at least really, really hard. Um, the way that you know we... We have an SMB business as well, you know, a commercial SMB business. And the way that we tried to combat that was that we actually, I would say, versus benchmark, kind of overhired designers to try to at least keep the overall UX of the product very, very contained and, um, and usable. But I don't think that there's a perfect answer there. But maybe the, the slightly more hot take thing that I would say is that I think that people worry too much about tech debt. I think that you should just, people should just generally worry like 25% less about tech debt. 
Right over here. Yep. Hey, uh, John Lovett from LBEX. We're an AI management platform. Um, and the question is, you talked about security and legal teams and how that can kind of like slow the process of working with an enterprise. And you also talked about not over-representing yourself as a like early, early stage company. Um, and so for a large company, a public company, to take a bet on a very small startup, how do they like wrap their hands around like, all right, this contract sucks. Uh, you don't have all the security <laughs> compliance that we would want. Like, how how do founders actually get these companies to say like, okay, cool, we'll take what we could do? Just to repeat the question for the folks in the back. Um, yep, yeah, question was about how do you navigate the security uh, and compliance of a company when you're an early stage startup trying to sell in. Yeah, so it's very it's very apropos because uh, we've been emailing because we're we're chatting <laughs> we're we are chatting with Elvex. Um, very excited about that. So uh, overall, the way that I've generally seen it work is is that I think that it's very important to get a super strong stakeholder um, at the early stages. That is a really strong stakeholder who is really championing the product. But I mean, that's pretty obvious at, at any stage. And then I think that the other side of it that gets a little bit underrated. But I, I was just actually chatting with a, a different company that um, that I've invested in before. Uh, this is I think it's extra important to just get in front of people if you possibly can, especially um, the more especially functions like engineering, IT, product that are like quasi-gatekeepers, but also technical enough that they, they can advocate for you with a security or with a legal team. And the reason that you want to be in front of them in person is just because you know, we're, all, we're all human beings, like we're all still mammals, and people you've been close to, you trust them more. And you, you just want, you want these people, when they're advocating internally, to just say like, hey, you know, that company, Elvex, whoever it is, like, I just kind of trust them. Like, you know, we got lunch with them. Like, they're they're trustworthy. Like, they, they know how to code. It's not going to break. Like, let, let's just let's just give it a shot. You know, we'll we'll put in a less sensitive use case first. Whatever it is, you you want to be able to build. I think you need the people to ultimately stake their internal reputations on you. Um, and ideally, you're going through a team where their internal reputation is technical enough that it it will be sort of internally trusted. That's an awesome answer. I think we have time for just one more. Um, back here. Yeah, when you're um, thinking about you know the maturing of the, the product organization, when do you think is a good time to add in product marketing? So you talked about when you want to add in product management. When are you adding in product marketing? Product marketing, um, that's a really interesting one. Um, I think it's hard, uh, to, hard to know. And I think it is very, very um, founder dependent, found, founding team dependent. Because I think that there are some founders who are extremely naturally gifted at product marketing. And they, it, it's not that they couldn't use a partner, partnership with a product marketer because they probably really, really could and product marketing is really important. But it's that they will just dominate that product marketer, and I don't want to say like bully them, but you know, it's it's not going to be the product marketer's idea on how to product market their this offering. It's going to be the founders, and and so I think that it's it's just really really dependent. And the question is more about when are you going to be able to kind of let go of the reins or know well enough what your position needs to be that you're comfortable letting go of the reins. Um, I'm also reminded of something that uh, our, our former CRO taught me, which I thought was really true, which is that companies get better at product marketing over time, naturally. Like It's sort of a problem that gets better on its own. And so as a result, I think it's a can that can get kicked down the road somewhat farther than you would think, as long as you have reasonable sales enablement and go-to-market enablement, because you will naturally learn to tell your story via guess and check. That's awesome. I realized that I was wrong and we have time for more questions. So <laughs> get the hands up. <laughs> uh, back there. Uh, with, with the, if you think, if you harken back to the early days and when you had pressures, uh, you know, the early days and now transfer it to today where there's speed and do things more efficiently, do you have any passion on what you need to W2 and what you actually should be fractionally partnering for excellence? Um, Got, so I guess the question is about like you know yeah where, where do you W two where do you fractional partner um, I'm I don't really believe in fractional personally and this is probably like completely biased by my own perspective of just having seen some fractional people who like did a really bad job at stuff um, but 
Yeah. Uh, oh, overall, uh, so here's here's the way I think about it: is that if you are if you're someone fractional, y- that almost immediately implies that you are not really thinking about the whole compounding journey. I'm not even saying that everyone who works at a startup needs to be there for for 10 years or anything like that, but you need to be bought in on the fact that the value of this is not the value today, the value of this is the value in 10 years, because that's when the compounding actually kicks in. And my my worry with a lot of um, fractional situations is that people kind of have their eggs a little bit too distributed into different baskets, and I think that's fine if you're an advisor or you're an investor because it's sort of known up front. But the issue with fractional is that if it's someone who's, say, like a fractional CTO or a fractional CPO, those decisions need the full context of sort of being completely immersed. At, you know, those are already not nine to five jobs. Forget fractional jobs. So I think that that's the challenge. But um, that's only just my own probably biased opinion. I, it can, I'm sure it can work in some circumstances. Choose some people. They don't want to hear from me. Uh, yeah, back here at the column. For what it's worth, I also agree that fractional is not a great um, aligning of incentives, especially when you're taking so much risk. And you know, I think when you're divided, your attention is divided. It, it, it doesn't eliminate your chances of success, but I feel like it's already a difficult journey that when you give 100% of yourself to something, it's no guarantee. So maximizing, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a lot of commitment. And being fractional, I feel like it may work in some circles, but I've actually had a lot of bad experiences very recently with people that were focused on multiple things. And my, my question also goes back to the early stages, which is the, you know, when the founding team gets it right, how many founders were part of, when you, you came in, you were number five, right? Yeah, I, I was five after the founders. Okay, so you kind of had, to, you saw the day-to-day of like that early small team. And I guess I'm curious, what kind of effect does that small team have on motivation? I mean, are people getting along with each other? Is it more like, hey, we come to work, we have our divisions, are people spending time late? I mean, are they getting to know their families? Like, what is it to be expected from having a co-founder, right? And I know that, you know, you were number five, whether that title means anything, but that early group, I mean, what, what, is, what did that look like for your company? And whether you've started other companies or invested in other companies, what kind of things do you look for in that founding group? Yeah, I, I think that I, I don't think that there's a single like one size fits all answer. I, I think that what is really important is that um, founders and early founding teams are well matched in terms of intensity. Um, and I also like I think that it, what's really challenging is if you have one or two members, or actually even worse, if it's like 50-50, and some people are like, hey, you know, this is like, it's not a nine to five, we're a startup, it's like nine to six, it's nine to six thirty. And other people are like, no, like this is this is my life and I'll like die before this company fails. Um, it, it's like really hard to, you know, kind of get through a meeting when you have those two different opposing viewpoints. I think we were uh, um, you know, we were very fortunate in that the, the founders and a lot of the early founding team were very much bought in on that. Um, and I would actually also just say that the other side of it is that there is sort of like, it, it's, it's not all equal. It's not like, oh, you know, be a low intensity team or be a high intensity team. It's like, be a high intensity team. Like, don't, don't be the low intensity team. <laughs> all right, one more. Uh, cool. Um, I think increasingly that like that you're still around, yeah. I, even after being like employee number five, um, I think like a lot of the phrase like early team is still around. Um, that seems to be really really rare. Um, you see places like Scale or Ramp, um, when you have like really exceptional killers, like they're aware that they're really exceptional killers. And even like a 25 year old making like seven hundred thousand dollars a year, that's not enough to keep them when the opportunity cost is now like any VC throwing like you know million dollars or two million dollars at them pre product. Um, I guess today in this environment, like, or what were, you probably at several points have been able to, you, you probably know that you could raise whatever you wanted to start your own thing, um, and you've like decided to stick around. Um, what is like the like mental, because it can't be like a economic, right, like argument for why people, like, how do you keep your first 10 people who are really good, and like you know that they're, they weren't like ambitious, they wouldn't be there. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's um, I think it's an interesting question. I think we actually have benefited from it because we haven't we actually have a number of, of folks on our leadership team who've been there for uh, for a very very long time. I think that there's a few, and actually not just on the leadership team, like throughout the organization, we we have um, pretty long tenure um, in a lot of in a lot of different areas. So I have a team member back here, Nick, who's uh, who's been on the team for a long time, for example. Um, 
So I think that there's there's a few components of it. One is something that like is not necessarily replicable, and in any case, I don't know if, even know if you would. Which is that we kind of grew at a rate that did not strongly incentivize like drop hopping. Um, where if you grow too slow, everyone's like, hey, you know, like, this thing's not growing fast enough for me. People bounce. Um, if you grow too fast and you're too buzzy, then people are like, "Oh wow! Like you know, you're you know engineer number number X at you know hyped up startup. Like of course you know X firm will will fund you pre seed off of like a two slide deck." And we we were kind of like in between those, <laughs> and so as a result, it's like it, it was. I think it was. Um, hopefully very interesting for people, sort of um, interesting, you know, economically and both sort of from an in intellectual stimulation uh, perspective. The other thing is that we um, very intentionally, at least within product and engineering, we, we try to instill a culture of having very, very high degrees of autonomy and very high degrees of exposure to all of the interesting things in the business. Because I think one of the real killers of motivation for people is where they're like, oh, like they locked me out of the room. You know, like when the real decision got made, I got locked out the room and no one asked for my opinion and then they came out and they told me what to do and it was different from what they'd said before they walked in the room and now I'm sitting here and it's like next time I'm going to be the boss I'm going to lock someone else out of the room and I, I think that that is like kind of the the mode unfortunately the motivator for a lot of folks and we we're not perfect about it we but we do the best that we can to really keep people informed and um, give people a lot of autonomy um, around decision making. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier about you know when you hire your first PM, where it's like we we basically won't hire even now a PM unless we actually have an area for them to really own. And it's like if you own it, you know you, you're you're the boss. Like tell tell us what we what you should be building. Awesome. I think that's all the time we have. But this was so great. Really, really appreciate you coming by and giving us all this knowledge and. Really, really love just how real you kept it. So thanks again for coming. We'll be here for the rest of the night. We have a few more minutes. John, do you want to say something? Take it, yeah. First of all, huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, I see you're, you're not on Twitter, but there are a lot of tweetables that you shared tonight. We loved <laughs> all of your analogies, so later you could search it and you'll see. Uh, but talk about longevity here in terms of you guys. What's really cool is we turned 12 as the NYTM this year, and to think back to actually April 2013, a year in, when Mark was actually, so Appboy slash Braze's co-founder, demoed 11 years ago when it was just a tiny company, and here you are, public company, CPO, just to see New York grow like that, we had made that early bet here when you talk about like it being desolate in 2012. So it feels really cool. And everyone in the room should be really proud that we do have a real ecosystem here across the suits and the hoodies. So seeing the room packed on nights like this just continues getting us all excited. Uh, so on that note, we actually have two awesome events coming up. So first of all, next Tuesday, the 23rd, is a product marketing night. So anyone in that space that wants to learn in a smaller form event, we have speakers from Temporal and Pinecone. So that's gonna be a really interesting night full of uh, also some great tactics. And then we'll be back in this room May 22nd. We're gonna have a VC panel with Priyanka from our team, with Grace from Lux Capital, and then with Sarah from Injuries and Horowitz Growth. So we'll get the seed A and B perspectives on uh, VC financing and trends right now. So. With that, we got drinks and food left. Uh, let's give one more round of applause and everyone enjoy. Thank you.